All right, chapter seven, section five, properties of trapezoids and kites. This is part two of two. Um, in this section, we're exploring the properties of trapezoids and kites. In our first part of this, we explored trapezoids and the properties of that type of quadrilateral. Again, not a parallelogram, important to emphasize that. Even though there is a single pair of parallel sides, the other pair of pair, uh, the other pair of sides are not parallel. That's important to understand about a trapezoid. But today we're going to focus on kites. Again, we'll all be very familiar with the term, and as soon as you see the figure, you will understand why it's called a kite. All right, so kites. Um, there's kind of a complex definition that you will see right here on the screen um, as to like formally what is a kite, how would we define it geometrically. Um, a little complex uh, as, as far as the wording, uh, to just use the math terms, a quadrilateral with two pairs of consecutive congruent sides, but opposite sides are not congruent. All right. Kind of the simple way to focus on what is a kite is simply to look at the picture of it. It's a lot easier to just visualize a kite that you would fly, right? So in any case, uh, the formal definition refers to it this way, that you have consecutive congruent sides and consecutive again refers to the fact that they are next to one another. I have two pairs of consecutive congruent sides, but opposite sides are not congruent to each other. So whatever the side length this is right here, it will not match the opposite side, All right? That's what will, and that, that set of definitions, as complex as it is, as dense as it is with geometric terms, um, that's what will create this shape that looks like a kite, simply. All right, so based on the shape, it's also important to point out, it's, it's pretty obvious visually, that this is not a parallelogram. And therefore, unlike in sections two, three, and four, it's not going to have the same attributes as any of those attributes that a, uh, that a parallelogram has it will have its own unique properties. So let's look at those. First of which is this, the diagonals theorem. Okay, again, as with all of these quadrilaterals, we can connect opposite corners on the inside to create what's called a diagonal. And in this case, these diagonals are going to be perpendicular to one another. Now this will sound familiar. We've actually dealt with um, diagonals being perpendicular to one another in a previous shape, in fact, a parallelogram, but it was very unique and specific to a rhombus, a special specific type of parallelogram in which uh, opposite sides were all congruent to one another, which included the very special rhombus of what we are all familiar with as a square, that the diagonals of those shapes are also perpendicular to each other. So what's the difference between a rhombus or squares set of perpendicular diagonals and this kites set of perpendicular diagonals? Okay, in a square or rhombus in the parallelogram version, not only are they perpendicular, but they are also bisectors of one another. They chop each other in half. It's very apparent here in this diagram that there is a much longer piece of this diagonal uh, on one part than another. So this is definitely not this horizontal diagonal right here. It's definitely not chopped in half, okay? Again, so um, the feature that is the same as that rhombus or square is that these diagonals will intersect specifically at a right angle to make 90 degrees, okay? The second theorem that applies here is, again, we're gonna see this very familiar phrasing, opposite angles. Okay, but here's where we have to be careful because again, this is not a parallelogram. In a parallelogram, both I have a single pair of uh, opposite angles that are congruent to one another. Okay, and this takes a little bit of practice spotting because again, the piece that um, a lot of students get caught up on when it comes to geometry where they fumble around a lot is it's very explicit for a lot of students. They think like, okay, well, this is the only kite I'm looking at. There are lots of different ways I can smush this together, stretch it out, uh, spin it around, orient it in different ways. Okay. And so being able to identify these pieces can be a little bit more challenging at times. Okay. So the way I think about it, in terms of a kite, whether it's like a little more of a squat kite, a little bit wider of a kite like this one, or a little bit longer like this guy, um, 
one way to think about it is like, I think of a kite similar to the shape of say like a manta ray, if you are familiar with the sea creature of a manta ray. A manta ray just kind of like draws here on the margins. This, I'm probably gonna mess this up. But a manta ray looks something similar to this. Um, and maybe this rings bells, maybe it doesn't. Uh, stingrays have this little tail after the fact, right? And little fins and stuff like that. Anyway, uh, this manta ray, uh, I think of it as the, the angles that will end up being congruent in this, what is similar to a kite shape, just to kind of, kind of show how I'm getting this kite type of polygon out of this guy, right? I'm actually kind of proud of this one. Anyway, um, the angles that will be congruent to each other are basically the wings of that manta ray, the arms, if if you will. Okay. And so in these kites, the angles that will be congruent to each other are the wings or the arms of that, uh, of that kite shape, as opposed to the fact that only those angles are congruent to each other. The other angles will not be congruent to each other. So you can kind of see it pretty obviously here in my little sketch of a manta ray. This angle up top here is much wider than this acute angle down at the bottom, right? So these are definitely not congruent to each other. The wings or arms of that kite are what will be uh, congruent to each other. So um, for the opposite angle theorem, that's, that's how I kind of visualize it. All right, so how will we see kites expressed in our problems and our assignments and stuff? So I give you an example over here in the margins. Here we're given the shape of a kite. We're told it's a kite explicitly. And as soon as we're told it's a kite, these two theorems will have to apply to it. Now, there are no diagonals drawn in here, but if I were to draw diagonals here, they would have to be perpendicular to each other. Okay, but the fact that I'm not given that um, means I don't have to worry about that theorem. The one that will apply here is this guy, the fact that the opposite angles, the wings or arms of that kite, D and F here, will have to have the same measurement. Okay, that's also given away by the fact that the other two angles right here, angle E and angle G, are definitely not the same measurement, meaning that they are the pair of angles that don't, are that are not congruent to each other, okay? Um, be prepared that uh, other ways that this could be like, you could see this, they could give you um, like this angle and then this angle, leaving that guy blank, All right? And so the, the feature with that expression would be that, well, whatever this arm or this wing is, that would immediately match whatever's opposite it. And then I could use that information with those three angles to figure out what's left over for that, that top one. So th that might be another way it's expressed, but let's, let's deal with this guy. All right, this will actually be pretty similar to um, previous examples we've done. So let me kind of slide this up and out of the way so that we can kind of work beneath this. All right, so here's our diagram. Our job is to find angle D over here. So the first thing I want to point out here is that this is still under the umbrella category of a quadrilateral. This is still a four-sided figure. And because of that, the sum of its interior angles still has to equal... 360 degrees, right? And so when I add up these angles together, right, I have the measurement of angle D plus the measurement of angle E plus the measurement of angle F and then plus the measurement of angle G. Whatever those four angles are added together, they have to sum total to make 360 degrees. And similar to previous examples that you've seen throughout this chapter, I'm basically substituting the stuff I know, namely angle E and then angle G, and solving for the pieces I don't. So explicitly, we can immediately substitute 115 degrees in for angle E and 73 degrees in for angle G. And this is still gonna have to add up to a total of 360. Now, here is again where we're gonna see something similar that we did in yesterday's lesson on, uh, on trapezoids. The fact that angle D and angle F have to be congruent to one another because of the opposite angles theorem in the kite. The wings or arms of this kite um, need to be matching. They need to, they need to equal each other. And so another way to think about it is that is that angle D and angle F have to match. They have to be the same thing. So in other words, I could ignore angle D here and say I could double angle F and then it's the same thing. Or I could ignore angle F and double angle D. 
I'll go ahead and do that because I'm ultimately asked to solve for angle D here. So uh, another way to write that would be two times the measurement of angle D plus 115 plus 73. That together has to equal 360 degrees. So now we're doing the, the, the simple algebra at this point, the sol solving for the missing variable that, we, uh, that we've done a couple of times now. All right, so in this case, I would just subtract the 115 and the 73 from the 360, or I could add these together first on the left and then subtract that total from 360. Let's go ahead and do that. So uh, I'll go ahead and do 115 plus 73. That gives me 188 degrees. If I subtract that from 360, I get 172 degrees left over. Visually, another way to think about this is that within this quadrilateral, if that's 115 and that's 73, there are only 172 degrees left over to split between angle D and angle F. But with the added knowledge that angle D and angle F have to match, algebraically what I'm doing is this, that I am dividing that number by two to show that both of those angles will get the same amount of degrees between the two. And so if I divide 172, by two, I get the following. I get 86 degrees, meaning that in my diagram, angle D is 86 degrees as well as angle F, even though I didn't need that piece. But then if that's 86 and that's 86 and that's 115 and that's 73, all of them together will give me that 360 total. But again, more specifically here for what I was asked to solve, measurement of angle D, is 86 degrees. And that's how you, that's a type of problem you will see in regards to kites. Um, again, be prepared to see things like variables thrown in there. Again, this general format of adding things together to equal the sum interior total, um, this is the general format it will be. If there are variables and stuff in there, you would just go about the same algebraic processes of combination of like terms and then isolating that variable just like we did here. But that concludes our talk on uh, section five. So I'll go ahead and stop recording there.